This week, our Patreon supporter Dylan joins me to discuss the first three volumes of The New Teen Titans by Marv Wolfman and George Perez. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon, and make that your bookmark for future purchases. Deconstructing Comics earns a bit of money from your purchase that helps us keep the show going. We really appreciate your support. This is Tim. This is Dylan. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs> uh, this is Tim in Tokyo, and I'm talking with Dylan down in Adelaide, Australia. How are you doing? I'm going well yourself. Okay. So, um, so I've got a bit of a throat lozenge in my mouth. <laughs> really professional. But I've been coughing lately. So, um, Dylan is one of our patrons on Patreon, and... Um, because of his support, he got the right to come on the show and uh, review uh, his comic of choice or you know series of choice uh, with me. Uh, so, Dylan, uh, first tell us a little about yourself, and then uh, you can tell us. Well, yeah, first tell us a little about yourself. Uh, I'm just a young comics fan from uh, South Australia. I grew up. Uh, I read like a lot of comics growing up, but I didn't really think about it until I got into teenagers and I tried to like keep up with it as much as possible. And that's basically it. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, I'm curious about why you chose this book because um, this is stuff that, that uh, came out before you were born. Well, I got into this series because, well, most of my generation, late 90s, they got into um, the Teen Titans, the actual characters themselves, through the uh, the 2003 cartoon show, mm. which was, like, very anime-esque, um, which adapted a lot of the storylines from the Teen Titans. So when I found out about that, I went back and picked up the trades for these, mm -hmm. and I, I got, like, hooked hard. This was, like... like this, is, this series has kind of been burned in my brain as, like, quintessential superhero comics like when i think about dc comics i actually think about this series now mm -hmm. even when i even when i think of comic like art from especially like um that era of the 80s george perez's art just instantly comes to mind mm, i see so so it was very influential on you even though you you weren't reading it in first run you were going back nah, for it almost nah, 20 I'm years too, later <laughs> yeah i'm too young to read it <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's just the writing also is just astounding. I've, I'm, I'm, it's really amazing how Marv Wolfman kind of wrote this series with the way that he developed the characters. He he explained, I think, in one of the introductions of these trades, or even in a few interviews, I'm not sure, but he explained that he um the method of writing a character of like his characters. So there's how many characters? I think there's eight. Oh. There's, one, so two, three. Seven heroes uh, at this stage. Seven, and then they add some more later on. But they, he he wrote them on like a like a I don't know like a spreadsheet or like a star, and in each character sort of worked off each other. Mm -hmm. So you had, uh, in particular with the three girls, Wonder Girl, um, Raven, and Starfire. He had Starfire be the more emotionally expressive character, who mm. is naive about morality and um human emotions mm -hmm. and then you had and, raven and more violent also yeah yeah she had to be more violent and that's how she was raised as like a alien warrior type and raven was raised as a uh, a very pacifist because of her her demon father who's part of her identity and if they if she lets it out she'll go berserk so she has to keep her emotions you know on the down low Mm -hmm. And that, and these two are sort of like polar opposites of each of each other, but there's things that are able to draw them together in the group of the Titans. Right. Yeah. And then Wonder Girl's kind of in the middle, halfway between them. Yeah, I remember he explained it as something like she's also someone that grew up in actually all three of them. They kind of all grew up in a very rigid social structure. Uh, Wonder Girl, of course, Themyscira, 
Raven, Azeroth, and uh, Starfire Tamaran, which is a little alien planet. Right, yeah, they all grew up in sort of unusual environments. Mm. And then there's, of course, um, the male characters. You, of course, have Robin, uh, Kid Flash, and Beast Boy. These three characters, in particular, they um, they aged up. Mm-hmm. Are, are you aware of what happened in the 80s with Robin in particular? Um, um, hmm. Well, go ahead and, and explain it. I, I was never much of a DC reader, so I just know kind of bits and pieces. Well, you know how he was, like, split into the Nightwing character? Um, well, the, I, I remember I was reading Teen Titans at the time that he ditched the Robin identity to be uh, Nightwing. Night, Night, Nightwing, yeah, that was in the part of the, um, what's it called, the Judas Contract storyline. Hmm. They, they, did, they did that because there was a, um, there was an in-house dispute between the Batman writers and um, Marvin George, they wanted to return Dick to like original kid age mm. because they already because they already progressed him. They already aged him up through the continuity of the story. They told them to get their own um, Robin, and then that created like two hundred Robins after that. So okay, that was the the origin of other having other Robins. Yeah, that's the that's the Jason Todd. That's why they created Jason Todd, and then they created five hundred others after him. <laughs> Yeah, which I basically just know about from listening to iFanboy, because um, I haven't read most of those stories myself. But Yeah, and th- I'll also say, this is um, this book in particular, this is actually a very important book for DC. Um, you, I remember hearing in a few of your podcasts, you said you were more of a Marvel reader growing up. Oh yeah, definitely. How would you say this series, because people always say this is like very Marvel for DC, especially at the time. Um, well, that was actually why I decided to try reading it around 19... So, the series started in 1980. It was around 82 or 83 that I decided to try it. Um, and to some extent, I could see the similarity to Marvel. But, I don't know, I I didn't stick with it all that long back then. Um... I can't remember how many issues I read, but um, my brother remembers that uh, I wrote a letter to to the Teen Titans book. Actually, it was to the Lone Star Comics new issue service newsletter. Saying that I thought Marv Wolfman was a little too preachy, <laughs> the way that he was writing it. Um, was this around the... the- the Brotherhood, uh, the, the what's it called? The cult, the Brotherhood of Blood, or something. All I remember about what I read back then was that Robin changed to Nightwing, and I think uh, Darkseid was in it. Oh yeah, yeah. Although my approaching... brother and I were reading his name as Darkseed, so we didn't get the the, <laughs> the joke of his name. But you know, e was it e i? How you know in English? How are you Dark... supposed to pronounce that? <laughs> I don't know. Ask Kirby. He's the one who made him. But yeah, I guess it's supposed to be Darkseid. Um, but that seemed may, might have seemed too jokey to me, so I may, I might have rejected that that reading. It must be Darkseid, whatever that means. <laughs> so, what do you think of the? Um, now that you've read the early issues, what do you think of them? Hmm. Um. Well, certainly. Uh, Imagination wise, Wolfman was on fire here because you know it's amazing to me how many new characters are introduced in volume one. <laughs> uh, let, me, because, let me try and think. Uh, so, no, you go on, sorry. Raven is new, Cyborg is new, Starfire is new, some of the villains are new, um, and you know, these are characters that are still around 40 years later. Oh, Deathstroke. Deathstroke the Terminator, yeah. Um, and he has who, and he has a lot of like, other characters related to him as well. He has his own like uh, line in DC, pretty much. And I I guess uh, the Hive is also appearing here for the first time. And I guess they, they're. Well, I, mean, they, I don't know, but I'm some, not well, sure if they. Will, okay, well, might, might, I, I got there that. Might have been some Green Lantern issue. I don't know. I'm sure. I I got that from reading some reviews on Goodreads, which aren't necessarily 100% accurate. Um, but someone there thought that that was the first appearance of the Hive. 
I'm not sure. I have to check up on that. There's, there's <laughs> I, I of, didn't. I didn't look it up. There's a lot of stuff that they reuse and they re-add. In fact, I'll. I'll also say that um, Kid Flash is also another character that basically developed in this series. Mm-hmm. He used to just be relegated to a lot of backup issues, but in this one, this is this series is when he sort of developed into like a very specific character. Then. After Crisis, which was 1986, he became the Flash for like 20 years or so. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. The, th- the thing about this series is that are you, are you aware of the reputation that DC's continuity had before um before Crisis? I know that it was considered to be a mess. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't so much a mess as um basically in the 60s they didn't have much of a um they basically just kind of wrote like how um how cartoons are kind of written that kind of continuity Mm. where they they might refer to something that's happened before but every story might as well take place in its own world sure Mm -hmm. and that's actually where marv wolfman started because um you know wonder girl donna troy she she was actually created by accident hmm uh, the original um, Teen Titans writer, uh, Bob Haney, he must have... he um, Basically, Wonder Girl used to just be like a Superboy-style character for Superman. You know how he's just Superman young? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it's the same character, just at a younger age. Yeah, that's what Wonder Girl was originally... Bob Haney, I don't think he understood that. He's he's <laughs> he's he's legendary in the Silver Age for being one of the goofiest writers, and also just he he just didn't care about continuity as a concept. He just took whatever, and he put Wonder Girl right in the Teen Titans alongside Robin, Kid Flash, and all the others. And yeah, you've, you've, he accidentally created a character right there. I see. <laughs> one one of Marv Wolfman's earliest writing jobs before he. Um, jumped on board to Marvel was that he actually wrote a backup in one of the early issues that actually gave Wonder Girl her name Donna Troy and actually gave her somewhat of a backstory. I see. And so this is what late late nineteen sixties. Yeah, this is the late nineteen sixties. So right before he jumped to Marvel. Okay. And when everyone jumped back to DC at the end of the 70s, because this is when uh, Jim Shooter came into Marvel, so a lot of writers and artists left. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't very popular. <laughs> yeah. George Perez left with Marv because he wanted to, um, he wanted to do, he wanted to be the, one of the um, only, the only artists to do both Justice League and Avengers, and he thought doing the Teen Titans would get him on that. Mm, okay. And basically, a lot of Marvel talent went to DC in the early 80s. And this series in particular, this boosted their sales. And it kind of put more of an emphasis on like having a more tight continuity, the way that uh, Marvel always sort of had. Mm-hmm. You know, ever since the 60s, Marvel always had that really you know, constructed continuity. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. This, this series sort of uh, pushed that. I see. Mm, so kind of Wolfman and Perez were sort of bringing that culture over from Marvel to an extent I think yeah mm, well and of course uh, Len Wein is working on this book too as editor and he's also coming from Marvel and he was working yeah. on Spider-Man in the 70s Len Wein was also working with Marvel Wolfman during the Tomb of Dracula so mm-hmm. okay everybody went over Right, yeah, and yeah, I, I remember reading some Amazing Spider-Man from like about 76 or 7 that I think was actually written by Len Wein. Yeah. If I remember yeah. right. So, yeah, and Pav, and I believe, wasn't Len Wein that, yeah, he was the one who invited, I think he was, Len Wein, he created um, Swamp Thing, didn't he? That sounds right to me. I wouldn't swear to it, but it sounds right. Let me, let me check. Uh, Swamp Thing. Because if that's the case... Um, yeah, Len Wein created Swamp Thing when he came over to DC, and he was the one that invited Alan Moore to DC, and, and, then, and then there was a wave of British writers to DC after that. So mm. 
a lot a lot of um, DC's revival period during the early 80s was in part because of the series the New Teen Titans. Hmm, sure. So you have so you have this series to thank for a lot of what happened in the 80s as a result mm. of this series. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's certainly a sort of turning point for DC, I think, and uh, and a lot of new characters coming in. Um, I don't know. I think the, the thing that bugs me most about reading it now is the language. Um, and to some extent, I think that's just the time. Because I remember uh, John Byrne's Fantastic Four. He had, you know, or Claremont's X-Men. There's a lot of the same kind of, you know, flowery prose. Yeah, I believe this is actually something that Marv Wolfman actually... I remember there was a there was a panel he did. I, re- I remember hearing this on Word Balloon. They did a um, he he hosted a panel that Marv was on. I think even he and them he 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 says that he that's the hardest thing he found about going back to his old work mm. is just the amount of dialogue that was in there. Well, yeah, there are a lot of words, and that's also typical of the time. And you know, I I ran into this when Kumar and I did the Simonson Thor issues a while back, where. You know, you're used to modern superhero comics, and then you go back to this stuff, and it just seems seems to take forever to read one issue. <laughs> <laughs> but also, you know, it's just so flowery and and uh, like like pseudo Shakespearean, um, including the way that a lot of the characters talk. Um, well, I can say, and, I can say that's that's how a lot of if you ever read the um, George Perez and Len Wein's run of Wonder Woman just after Crisis, everybody mm. talks absurdly Shakespearean. <laughs> It reminded me actually of that um, that four run. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that gets sort of annoying to me. Um, and even so, in I, re- I read the first three volumes here, which is issues one to twenty, and then the four issue Tales of the New Teen Titans miniseries, which is uh, the origins of the newer characters. And the the issue about Cyborg, I mean, you know, he's been talking the sort of street English, more or less. And then when he's narrating his own story, then he sounds much more Shakespearean. (laughs) (laughs) Wolfman kind of gets the voice wrong there in the narration. (laughs) He made a whoopsie. (laughs) Well, I found several kind of Wolfman uh, mistakes in, like, continuity, like minor continuity points where, like, at one point, I think it's... One example, issue, maybe issue two, issue one or two, the narration says that the Titans just got together, but they're already fighting as one. And then a couple issues later, Robin is saying, this is the first time that we've been all been fighting the same battle instead of seven different ones. So, well, so at the past, then you weren't all fighting as one, but um, it's, it's inconsistent it's there. Is that because of, like, he the... The first preview issue is like imagining everything. Does he count that? No, I'm I'm not talking about that. But in in yeah, there there is a preview in DC Comics Presents number twenty six. Um, so, but no, in in Teen Titans issue one, New Teen Titans issue one or two, the narration says that the Titans have just gotten together, but they're already fighting as one. But then a couple issues later, Robin himself contradicts that i didn't even see that must have gotten hypnotized by the art (laughs) (laughs) and i found a few other inconsistencies like that you know they're minor but uh, reading it the second time especially i started to notice things like that be glad be glad you aren't reading uh dc comics nowadays (laughs) that they have line-wide continuity errors like i remember a while back um it was like a batman issue um in Tom King's Batman run, they had a man bat. He was he was in like Arkham Asylum or something. Mm. Even though that he's a member of uh, the Justice League Dark, mm. and he's in like a magical world, and okay. th- things are happening at the same time. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, um, I mean, I, I'm still somewhat active Marvel reader, and I, I think you know, some time ago, Marvel sort of backed away from being so picky about continuity um and there are those kinds of of contradictions more often now i think they just decided that it it was 
impossible to when when there are so many different writers working on the books to uh, have everything fit together exactly i have a feeling uh comics back in the silver and bronze age they i had a feeling it was a bit easier to police where every character was N- mm-hmm. nowadays i have a feeling it's like you know if you want to read batman for a month you're reading like 10 different books and he's everywhere yeah so there was a period what about a year ago where uh Galactus was appearing in two or three different books at the same time. He was in Fantastic Four, and he was also in Doctor Strange, and I think he showed up somewhere else around the same time, too. He gets uh, around. He's a big man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing I do enjoy about New Teen Titans in particular, and I think, I'm not sure how to describe it, but I will say this. They somehow managed to give every every issue its own identity, and not in a very strict continuity sense. But every issue follows on from every other issue, but they all have their own unique story. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And on top of that, each individual page is laid out for for a separate set of place, action, and event. It's hard to describe, but basically every page is its own identity. Okay. And that's how the page layouts work. I'm trying to find an example. But the way that um, George Perez does his layouts... It lends each page to its own... The only way I can describe it is it has its own identity. Hmm. Oh, here we go. The Assault on Titan's Tower issue. Um, okay. Alright, so if you look at the the first two pages... Okay. So page uh, two, three. Page one here. They're all in the um, the city. Uh, Sorry, they're all in the park here. Mm Mm-hmm. And the... The page next to it, they moved into the into the inner city. Page after that, it's the fearsome five um, organizing within their base. Mm-hmm. Page after that, they're at Titan's Tower. Page after that, Titans return to Titan's Tower, and um, they get tra- and Raven gets trapped there. Next page, they find out and all um, and they all um, try to enter tr- Titan's Tower. Page after that, they're in Titan's Tower, and they're um, and they're trying to find Raven. Next page is actually a really cool um, picture of the Titan's Tower itself. Yeah, the diagram, or the, yeah, they've just found the blueprints of it, and so then we see how it's laid out. Next page, they're interrogating um, Cyborg's um, father. Next page is a um, Cyborg gets hurt, and this whole page focuses on um, uh, Raven trying to calm Cyborg. Next page is a fight scene, and it's based around the stairwell here. Mm-hmm. Next page is a um, is a brawling fight scene between Donna and uh, what's the name of this guy? Goliath. Uh, next page is um, around the water area, um, and that's where uh, Robin gets uh, put into the water here. Yeah, he's tied up and thrown in the pool. Yeah. Next. And then, yeah. So this, you know, what, you know what I'm talking about. There's a very specific yeah. sense of pace, and yeah, um, each page has kind of pace. its own theme or focus. Yeah, and it goes on like that into the series, and it's very something specific to. Um, I've noticed it's very something specific to Prez. I've seen it in his Wonder Woman as well. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't yet read that Avengers run with Kurt Busiek, although I'm trying to get that. Oh, that's that's my favorite Avengers run. So, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of surprised we've never talked about it on the podcast before. But it's it's, exp- it's expensive to get. It's out of print ah, everywhere. Well, I've I've got all the original paper issues. So, <laughs> <laughs> does it does it does that kind of follow the same kind of trend that he has? I've seen it in uh, his Kung Fu, um, Master of Kung Fu as well. What do you mean his trend? Uh, his page layout trend. Hmm. He, he has a very specific way of um, pacing stuff. It might. I, yeah. I haven't looked at it in a long time, but there's a, there's a few quintessential George Perezian uh, page layout designs. One of my favorites is like there's like a face somewhere. There's like a big face and a monologue, and there's events happening around the face. Mm. Mm-hmm. Have you seen? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think there there are a few of those in in this in these Titans issues. Uh, there's one here on page 114, first volume. There's one. 
there's a lot of them in um, crisis. Mm, yeah, digitally page 109. Um, yeah, it's around Raven's face. He does a lot of other ones. There's a few others where it's like the side of their face and there's like a and there's like a series of small panels around it. I've seen there's also another Perez thing and have you noticed he does this thing where occasionally there'll be a large shot of something big happening and there'll be smaller panels around it or, or sometimes there'll be smaller panels of like someone's facial reaction to something. He really likes emphasizing facial reactions to things. Mm. I've seen so many people cry in Teen Titans. <laughs> and Wonder Woman. There's so many panels of, of zoom-ins of people crying or mm. reacting to something in a very specific way. Mm-hmm. I haven't really seen anything else like that. He also really likes thin panels. Have you seen that? Yeah, well, when you're, when you're reading it in, in guided view and comicsology, you really notice that, especially re- yeah. since I'm reading it on my phone. I have to keep rotating. <laughs> I will say it looks amazing on page. In fact, he's he's one artist. I'd say you want to get the biggest version of of it as possible. But he really likes breaking up panels in, in very thin strips. It's very hard to describe. It's thin vertical strips. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there's even multiple things happening in a single thin um, thin shred. There's one in the um, issue where they verse the Justice League, and there's like pile. And they're all like melting, and there's like piles of ash, and they're all just kind of like melting away. Mm-hmm. Um, layout wise, there was one place that really stuck out for me. It's issue seventeen, uh, beginning of volume three, where there's uh, this uh, young woman who seems to have been possessed by some kind of demon, and I believe uh, in this section, it's cha- the part uh, that's chapter two of the story. Um, and they've got this, uh, which, uh, issues, uh, which issue 19, 17, 17 page. Well, so digitally it's page 17. So it's probably a few pages later for you. The, the, um, is it, is it page eight of the comic? Um, page starting page 10, the, the part, the one that's headed chapter two, the devil within her the devil within her. And that's the page after that. So, um, in this scene, uh, she is hooked up to some kind of machine and they're trying to analyze her. And then this, uh, evil presence starts to appear and everything starts to go haywire. And the panel layout becomes like as if things are spinning. Oh, so yes. The, the second, circle. Yeah. So the second page. The first, the first, like the top half of it is the more normal panels, but the bottom half, you start to see this sort of rotation. See how the the gutters are sort of like spokes, but just like the bottom half. And then the next page, there's a circle in the middle, and the panels are all sort of broken out around it, and it's like something is spinning. Like and a- then the page after that, it starts to slow down again, and and it, it's really interesting how he did those three pages yeah he's really good at do- um either giving a sense of motion through his pa- panel designs or he's very good at um showing the transformation of something mm-hmm. there's a there's an there was a really impressive um it's in ish- it's in volume two it's the doom patrol issues uh I actually bought the individual issue of this because it impressed me so much. Ooh. He he went to the um so there's a there's a sequence where um the Teen Titans a few of them they're in uh I'm trying to find basically the Titans have been thrown into this pit that is the concept is that they de- they de- it de evolves them. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. yeah it's issue fifteen page one seven one. It's on the front cover, but in the actual story itself, there's a sequence where... Who's in there? You've got Cyborg, Wonder Girl, um, Raven, Starfire, and the rest. Uh, Basically everybody. They're all de-evolving, but he actually even went to the trouble of actually drawing how Starfire would look as a a de-evolved... Like, everyone else looks like primates, but she almost looks like a cougar. Page uh, 178. Uh, comic page is seven. Mm, okay. 
Yeah, yeah, she looks more cat-like. Yeah. I found that interesting, because you would have to go into extra effort to decide how that alien race would look like in a de-evolved form. Right, yeah, that gets into a whole backstory of her race. Uh, maybe he was thinking they evolved from cats rather than from apes. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's some kind of deep thought about the whole <laughs> her whole background. And that was explicitly stated through art. No one actually like really mentions that. No. I f- I found that just very impressive just as a like a small little detail that was added. Mhm. Mhm. I wonder if that was Wolfman Wolfman's idea or Perez alone. I'm not sure because I, I mean Prez is very detail orientated. If you you look at any one of his panels and it's just detail on detail. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's where he got his reputation as being the guy that's able to draw like a million characters in one panel, especially in the Crisis series. He draws like a, a whole bunch of characters, <laughs> you, a whole a whole bunch of characters that up until that point nobody had even thought about for like forty years. He draws them in like pa- like very large panels. I'm sorry, very large group shots. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I I read some of Crisis when it came out because one of my friends in college handed it to me. So, yeah, okay, I'll read this, even though I don't really know <laughs> the background. Um, but yeah, I vaguely remember reading some of that in 1985 or 6. Coming up, parent-child relationship issues in New Teen Titans being weirded out by Wonder Girl's boyfriend and Cyborg's dialect, the weird geography of the United States in DC Comics, the DC hardcover softcover era, and more. I'm continuing to republish classic episodes of Deconstructing Comics in reverse order, unlocked by our patrons' generous support. This week's classic episode from May 14th, 2007, features a review of Why the Last Man, Volume 2. The classic episodes can be found on our Facebook and Twitter feeds by clicking on the earliest months listed on the left sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com or in publicly available posts on our Patreon page or in the Patreon smartphone app. Check out all our goals and help us reach them at patreon.com slash deconcomics. You like cheap comic books, right? Well, I'm Professor Allen. And I talk about cheap comic books on the Quarterbin Podcast. In every episode, I'll dissect a single comic from my collection, as long as I paid no more than 25 cents for the issue. Forget about $4 new comics that you can read in four minutes, or crossover events that can cost 100 bucks to collect. Join me in the Quarterbin, where even bad comics are a bargain, and good ones are a steal. The Quarterbin Podcast is part of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Visit us at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search Relatively Geeky or Quarterbin Podcast in iTunes. I guarantee it'll be worth every penny. What did you think about the, um, of all the characters, which ones do you find the most interesting? Well, of course, I I know Robin the best, um, being a Batman sixty six fan. Although that's a little bit different, Robin maybe. Um, I, I guess you know. Hmm, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, maybe it's too easy to say Starfire just because she's hot. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. As a character, I was I was kind of interested in Changeling. Uh, Beast Boy. Yeah, now, like to be called. well, yeah. So he in in this series he has dropped Beast Boy and changed to Changeling. Um, I happened to read some of the Wikipedia page for Raven uh, this evening, and um, it said that she got in a relationship with him later on. But the page kept calling him Beast Boy, and I was wondering, did he change back, or is that just an error on the part of the Wikipedia writer? Uh, I believe he changed, from my understanding, in the most of the Jeff Johns run, which was the 2000s run, he's mostly referred to as Beast Boy, and that's when they go in a relationship with each other. Okay. 
All right, so yeah. it was accurate. But I was surprised because, like, in, in 1980, he's so insistent that he's not Beast Boy anymore. He's changeling. Yeah. <laughs> he's, a, he's, also a very, he's also a very good receptacle of very early 80s pop culture. Have you noticed that? Well, yeah, he keeps men- mentioning things like the Muppets or Star Wars or other things that I couldn't even quite place anymore. <laughs> uh, Atari games? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. It's great. Um, one character I really like because of just how unique she is, especially in this form of herself, is uh, Raven. If you actually have you noticed that throughout the whole series, she's like almost a complete pacifist. Mm-hmm. She never commits any violence throughout the whole series. She only exists purely as an empath, and she and she's basically exists only within the emotional side of things. She's basically just the emotional support for everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she's like guiding the Titans to do what what she needs them to do to defeat Trigon. Yeah. Um, after the Trigon stuff, she becomes a bit more of like a... Um, I don't know how to describe it. She doesn't lead as much, but she does... Um, she's always the one with the... You know, this is, a, this is a bad thing, this is a good thing, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But um, but just the um, I just find it very unique that this kind of character would be in this period, especially just the non-violence part of it. Well, I felt like Wolfman was trying to say something about non-violence because in the first volume it kind of keeps coming up, and you know she grew up in this temple Azarath, and you know they teach like total non-violence. Um, even if it's to defend yourself, don't be violent at all. And uh, he keeps, you know, Wolfman keeps sticking in uh, sort of jibes at that way of thinking. Like in issue five, Robin says, don't they understand? Peace doesn't just happen. You have to work to maintain it. Um, And Starfire says something similar in the next issue. Um, And I felt like uh, Wolfman had some particular reason to bring this up, although I couldn't quite put my finger on well he, given the time period it might have had something to do with american politics with jimmy carter i'm not sure um, um but, i think it's just a character um sticking it's again i think he wanted a um because you know how starfire is very violent she um mm-hmm. if anything crosses her she, she won't she won't hesitate to go out of her way to murder her, especially um when it comes to people who've like like, very personally harmed her, even her own sister. Raven is supposed to be the complete opposite of that. So she's ve- so she's very... Ext- I don't want to say... You can't really be extreme in pacifism, but she's very ardent mm-hmm. in that worldview. And Marv Wolfman is really the only writer that's actually... The, the, the only writer who's kept this consistent about her. If you... If you look... <laughs> Raven in every other media, she's very violent. If you watch the cartoon show, she's like... She's doing Chun Li kicks on people. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't know. I I felt like Wolfman was setting up the Temple Azeroth's teaching as being something that he disagreed with. Like he was he was targeting that. It felt like to me, but I, th- I don't know. I'm unsure. I know he um, you know the Brother Blood cult. Did they get introduced in this one? Uh. There's a cult that gets introduced later on who hmm. they're like this um they're, they're just like a you know like a like a fictional cult they they run out of some foreign country that 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 is that I think it's the same country that Terra and uh, Geoforce is from but the the um Marvel when I remember he said he got the idea for that cult through like 80s um preachers on TV or something mm mm-hmm. mhm so he was taking like a jive at that. Mm, sure. Yeah, that's a, a, a major target. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there were some other things happening around the time, but I know that I remember around that part of the series. I remember he did that part. It was either after or just before. There's like a there's like a space part later on that happens later on. And they do like this whole space saga with um, Starfire, and then they immediately go back to a more street level story after that. Hmm. That's also another thing that they um, that they brought up um, in one of their writings. 
they wanted all these characters they were able to do different types of stories with so with starfire they could do more sci-fi stories um and with Cy- Cy- cyborg and uh, starfire they could do more um, sci-fi stories um they could do more fantastical stories with Wonder Girl and the whole Themyscira and Greek God stuff that becomes really... I think George Perez really liked that because he stuck with it in the late 80s. And with Robin, they did more detective stories. There's one in particular, there's a famous issue called Who is Donna Troy, which is a very famous issue for like Robin being a very almost Batman-esque detective. Mm-hmm. And with Raven, they obviously do a lot more like horror-based stories, like the whole Trigon thing. Mm-hmm. I was surprised there's actually an issue where they actually kill a kid. Right, yeah, that shocked me with, with uh, <laughs> Trigon. Um, so, yeah, I forgot what issue that was in the first volume, um, ah. where um, Trigon is this like incredibly evil uh, kind of devil creature who is just um trying to take over more and more territory subjugate more and more people and uh raven says she's going to uh surrender herself to her and and rule with him to save earth so they go to wherever it is that he works in this dimension and some little girl says that he's a monster and so he starts zapping her to punish her and uh raven undoes what trigon has done to her and saves her and then trigon says nope you got to punish them and he just zaps her to dust and yeah that really shocked me in an in a comic of that era because you know usually they would (laughs) the writers would go to pains to show that actually nobody died no matter what happened (laughs) <laughs> I, I, will, I will say this. This is around the same period that um, Frank Miller was doing his Daredevil run. I think there were a few more other serious runs happening around this time. Mm-hmm. I, I just got done reading um, Astro City, The Dark Ages, which is like two volumes. And at the end, Kurt Busiek dedicates it to like all these all these writers from the late eight, uh, from late seventies, early eighties, and Marv Wolfman's name is there. Mm-hmm. So I think this is like the start of the period where comics are starting to be a bit more serious i remember this series in particular i don't think a lot of kids were probably reading this i think a lot of teenagers were probably reading this series back in the 80s or a mm-hmm. bit older because it's a very dense read there's a lot of like very specific kinds of almost i wouldn't say almost coming of age because they're already basically are uh, young adults but well, there's a lot of but- like but there's a lot of parent-child relationship issues with all of the all of the hero characters. Oh yeah, that's one thing. I remember Marv. He said that he he wanted to um, really get the point across that these people that, th- that these uh, kids are c- becoming their own individuals, and they don't they don't need like older type characters because in the original Silver Age run, um, there was this character <laughs> introduced called Mister Jupiter, who was like. So, the the story was that um, the original the Teen Titans and the Silver Age they fail to protect this peace activist who gets killed. So they vow never to use their powers again. And then they hook up with this like borderline creepy dude named Mister Jupiter who becomes their like their their father mentor and and that hap- and that happens for like four years worth of the continuity mm. and marv in particular he didn't he didn't he didn't like the idea that they had to have a um like a parental figure he thought that that was kind of like a uh, like a wish fulfillment for like you know older people who are like if only these kids would listen to me <laughs> well i guess also and, the, the titans in that age were a little younger than these characters they were more like early teens in the 60s version, right? Where here, they're pushing 20. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've always liked how... Um, even I think George Perez even shows this with... Have you noticed that like Robin is li- literally like bulging out of his suit? <laughs> I didn't notice that. I think this is, the, this is the start of the sexualization of Dick Grayson as a character. He's, hmm. like, he's literally just known for his ass nowadays, and I think it starts here. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, I felt like the whole parent-child thing was hit a little too hard um, because I I kept sort of feeling like I was reading almost the same story but in a different setting. 
because you've got the supernatural thing with Raven and Trigon, and then you've got Cyborg, um, and, Cyborg Cy- and his dad. Cyborg and his dad, and yeah, and Robin Star- with Batman. At Robin with Batman, uh, Starfire uh, with her her relationship where and you know with both raven and starfire it's like i can never go home again i'm not supposed to go home again um oh, they, for they a little bit different reasons but they do go back to starfire's home at one point well of course they do but <laughs> um you know because otherwise there's no story but um yeah i mean it just it started to feel a little repetitive in a way uh, they are i mean I know that um, Kid Flash is shown to have a healthy relationship with his parents. Yeah, very healthy. Um, and I know, and eventually Robin comes around um, with Batman, but that's like way down the line. That's during the whole. Uh, uh, you remember the what's that? You know, you remember the famous story where Joker kills um, uh, Jason Todd, the one that people phone. Okay, <laughs> the, the yeah, I know on. about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think soon after that is when they introduce the next Robin, and uh, and that's when Dick Grayson comes around with Batman. Okay. So it takes, you know, five years before they get back together. Wow, okay. By the way, you were mentioning the uh, pop culture references. I, I just had to mention this. I don't know if you noticed it or not. Issue 10. Um, so uh, Deathstroke has this, uh, like scientist guy that works for him mm. um and his name is benson honeywell and he looks like a human more a little bit more human version of bunsen honeydew from the muppets really i mean and, there was a mu- I, I do know <laughs> there is an issue where uh, beast boy says um kermit's right it ain't easy being green right but yeah, I mean, this is a you know full. On, it's it's obviously copied from Bunsen Honeydew, and in fact, he mentions that he has an assistant named Bleaker, and Bunsen Honeydew's <laughs> assistant is Beaker. So you know, it's it's no accident. I was I thought that was the funniest thing in the whole series. <laughs> I have a feeling that like when they were actually making this series, they had like a TV on and was just playing the Muppets. <laughs> Let's use that. Sure. Yeah. Quite possibly. Maybe some a VHS okay, well, tape. <laughs> what, what what did you think of the whole um, story that Cyborg had with his parents? Um, it was interesting. It was I found it a little frustrating. Where this happens in a number of the stories, where somebody needs to tell somebody something and they just can't seem to tell them. And oh, they can't tell them because they're just so like. Cy- I know what you're talking about. Cyborg is just so pissed off at his father. He just can't listen to him. And he's and the father's trying to say I have cancer. Yeah, that I have cancer, and to explain exactly what happened, because Cyborg doesn't seem to realize why he was turned into Cyborg and and why his mom died, and so he's blaming his dad for everything and won't listen to what his dad says. Um, and then like Raven has a hard time explaining like why she needs the Titans to help against Trigon, although that's explained um, as. Trigon magically stopping her from explaining it, but still, it's <laughs> frustrating to read. <laughs> yeah, well, that's sort of just there to like keep the drama going. Sure. For a bit. Yeah, I mean, just that's, the it's base. just like soap operas. I mean, I used to watch yeah. General Hospital, and it's the same thing. It just Dude. drags it out because somebody just can't seem to explain, uh, or the other person won't listen. Um, but as as far as to answer your question. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it was nice to see a resolution to that, and it's a, a very a sweet ending to that story. Um, yeah. But I, I would have liked it a little bit sooner, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I forget how soon it happens. It happens in, like, issue five or so. But then again, reading these comics, it takes a while. <laughs> right, yeah, Ooh. it's a long read. Well, um, speaking of, yeah, the, the end of the first volume... Um, issue eight um i mean uh it's that a day in the lives issue and it's always fun especially with a team book to see the heroes on their day off um you know the x-men used to do that sometimes too or i guess maybe they still do i, I don't wish, read it i wish anymore, they still but... did issues like this they don't do them more. <laughs> they don't do them anymore mm, but yeah i mean those issues were always fun or like you know the x-men would be playing softball or something 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember this day of life issue. You have you have you have Cyborg hanging um hanging out with the um uh with the handicap with the handicapped kids. You have uh Raven does the whole out of body thing. Yeah, and she of... and she finds that she can she can stay outside of her body more than what was it five minutes ten minutes. I mean, it's, that seems like a holdover from um, oh, what's his face? The, I think he's the Element Man from Doom Patrol. He can't be out of his body for more than a minute, otherwise he dies. Hmm. That's what that's what it always reminded me of. But I do miss issues like that. I, I love the I do like the way that this series is paced. You can I can just read and I can just read an issue, and it's just one adventure that leads into the they'll you know like bleed a little bit into the next issue and comics aren't really paced like this anymore mm-hmm. nowadays they're paced for like you know an eight issue arc right well and they're more decompressed nowadays although i think they're not quite as decompressed as they got like in the early 2000s um uh, sometimes I, I there'd be like that. five words in a whole issue but <laughs> <laughs> what's i heard about what was that i heard marvel had that one month for a it was like a silent month or well, something? Well, yeah, there was, was like- that, too. When was that? In the 2000s at some point. They, they had a month that they called Nuff Said, where <laughs> one, one issue of every book was like completely without dialogue. Yeah, that was kind of interesting. That was an interesting exercise. Was it line-wide? Pretty much, yeah. I think almost every comic that month was silent. What, they handcuff all the writers for the month? <laughs> Yeah, so they. I remember even some of the books had part of the script in the back where you could see how the writer just wrote all the instructions for the artist. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say this: um, if you read this series throughout it, you can actually see the way that um, certain elements, such as the repetitive. Um, you know how in the earlier issues of this series, there's a lot of repetition about the, um, like they'll describe a power or they'll describe a situation or they'll describe a relationship and they repeat it mm-hmm. like a few times. Mm. That stops becoming a thing in the later issues and it starts to become a bit more modern the way that it's written. When you go further into the years 1984, 1985 to 1986, it becomes way more, um, like a more of a modern comic in that regards. There's no re- there's no repetition in that regard. Hmm. Hmm. I see. Yeah, I'm a little curious to to read the, uh, some more volumes and at least like, get back up to w- where I read when it was coming out. That that would be the Judas contract. That's a that's a story. In my opinion, that's a storyline that's best read when you when you get to it. Yeah, I might like a, have, since I hadn't read the early issues, I might not have appreciated it well enough at the time. So I was kind of coming in to, in the um, middle. You know the Dark Phoenix saga story for X Men. Oh yeah, isn't that isn't that the same kind of thing? You don't really want to just read it; you want to like build to it. Uh, yeah, definitely. I I, I think if you just picked up X Men One Thirty Seven, it wouldn't have much meaning without having read the previous twenty or thirty issues. Yeah, and that's the, and I think that's the same thing with the Judas contract. And unfortunately, DC doesn't seem to know that because they've just <laughs> they released they released trades of it. They they made like they adapted it in the original Cartoon Network show, mm. and then they also made its own like animated movie. Hmm. Okay. So they've also done like like just many different versions of that story. <laughs> I don't think they realized why that story kind of stuck the way that it did. Hmm. Yeah. And by, and, and by that point, the story becomes very, very mature. You have Slade Wilson sleeping with Tara, who's like fifteen. Hmm. So again, you have. I don't. The, the comics code won't exactly look in that that time of. <laughs> yeah, I'd forgotten about Tara. I I did see a picture of her somewhere recently. Yeah, she looks kind of. Yeah, now that you say her name, that kind of brings it back. She she had just entered the Titans at that time, right? Uh or was she only yeah, she, around for that for that story? Uh she was supposed to just die in that story, but she keeps coming back. Just okay. like everybody does. <laughs> right. Everybody yeah, does. superhero comics, nobody really ever dies. Or almost nobody. Oh well, yeah, what's your what's your opinion on uh, Terry Long? 
Well, yeah. So that's <laughs> Wonder Girl's boyfriend. Um, and yeah, so he's said to be like, what, 29 or 30? He's 29. Um, and he's just, he's just okay. And so we don't know. Ex- I don't think it said exactly how old Donna is, but she's less than 20. And yeah, a few of the readers on Goodreads were kind of skeeved out by that. And like, ew. Okay. Um, <laughs> Terry Ter- Long is like an infamously like he's just an infamous character for being weird. People think that he's like a uh, he's like Marv Wolfman's like Mary Sue or well, you call it like self insert. That's what that's what the word I'm looking mm. for. People think he's like self insert. So, he wanted to sleep with Wonder Girl, so he <laughs> put himself in the comic as this studly guy with with a bunch of chest hair. <laughs> What's what's funny about him is when I was reading the series, I'm thinking this guy's going to portray them at some point. This, this, he just has to be. This guy has to be some kind of asshole deep down, and he, he never turns. You always think he's going to turn, but he never does. And apparent. And don't worry, John Byrne got pissed off enough, and he just killed him anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you since you mentioned it, yeah, that it does seem like. You know, when when somebody like that gets introduced, you expect them to have some sort of effect on the story as a villain or as a victim, one or the other. Um, and yeah, in, in these issues, he, neither one he's happens. Just he's kind of there and he's going on there, dates with married. Donna. <laughs> yeah, he get, he gets married to her eventually. There's like a big wedding issue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, he's just he's just. I don't know. It's just weird how this character again. I bet you everybody was thinking, "When's this guy gonna turn?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a. Yeah, well, that that, that, I... that might be a good, the best explanation that he's Wolfman. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, yeah. Well, he looks a little bit like a Wolfman because he's got a beard and. <laughs> why does he? Why does he have to be drawn so seventies? Right. Yeah. He looks like. John Travolta from Saturday Night Fever with no, no, a beard. No, no. no, sorry, what is he? No, he looks like the um, he looks like the blonde Bob. Uh, what's his name? The, the painter guy. Why is his name escaping me? Painter. Yeah, Bob Ross, the painter. Okay, I'm not sure who that is. He's a famous painter guy. He was on um, the Joy of Painting guy. Okay. If you look at Bob, I think <laughs> you, you'll see it. Um, one one of the reviewers on Goodreads who was an uh, uh, African-American woman was sort of offended by the way that Cyborg talks. Yeah, it, he's, he's written to talk. They His dialogue is written, like, phonetically. Yeah, listen, or L-I-S-S-E-N, I'm... or maybe, maybe is M-E-B-B-E, maybe. Um, and... And I was thinking, well, like, he's supposedly really highly educated, um, but he talks like somebody who just barely was able to finish high school. And actually, I found in uh, issue, I think it was, yeah, issue nine, Raven asks him about that. She's saying, like, you're highly educated, but you don't show anyone that. And he says, well, using slang makes me feel comfortable. Like, well, yeah, is that slang? It's... He More... says he says like I, I love talking street or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just doesn't quite work for me either. Um, but yeah, it's just I, like yeah, this yeah. is how black people talk. Although th- there are some other white characters who talk a little bit like that too. I think if he just apostrophed a few of the words, it sounded li- <laughs> the way the, the problem. The problem with it nowadays is it's written very phonetically, mm-hmm. so it kind of makes him sound like he's a bit. Like it almost makes it sound like he's a bit dopier. Mm-hmm. But I have a feeling if you wanted to convey someone's sort of accent, because I'm I'm su- I'm imagining he's supposed to sound like a like a New York black man. Yeah. Usually nowadays that would be conveyed through apostrophing a bit more in the words. Like listening, yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. He, he does that too, but um, yeah, not not only that. Um, but like I think Gizmo from the Fierce and Five talks like that somewhat also, and he's white, so yeah, it's not only the black character, but yeah, this 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 um series is very New Yorkian. 
Hmm. Well, and like, th- since you mentioned that, we haven't mentioned that it was really unusual at the time for a DC comic to be set in a real city, not you know Gotham City or Metropolis or something. Uh, it's it's always pissed me off that <laughs> they have New York when they have Metropolis. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't Growing- quite make sense. Like, how many cities are there in, in the DC US? <laughs> well, I mean, when I, when I was growing up, I always just assumed that Metropolis was like the um was just like the New York of the DC, and they didn't have a New York. But then, like when I actually get into DC, they actually do have a New York. And on top of that, Gotham and Metropolis are supposed to be both in Delaware. <laughs> I didn't know that. Delaware. Yeah, apparently, <laughs> apparently they're just over like the bay of each other. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, this is. I feel like this is. This is this. I think this is what also kind of reminds me of like a bit more Marvely. It's again, it's very specifically New Yorkian. They do mention specific uh, street names, right? Yeah, he talks about like or sections of town, like the East Eighties or whatever. I mean, and yeah. see you on Forty Second Street. To someone who doesn't hasn't lived in New York, it doesn't mean very much, but. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just it just now it, to everyone who's not from New York it just announces that they're from New York. Yeah. <laughs> so overall, how would you how would you see how, how do you perceive the first what well, this is what 1980 I think this goes up to 1983. Well, so no, 1982. So this is yeah, 20 issues would get him into 82 um and then those those four mini series issues. So yeah, this is still maybe a year before I started reading. Um, and like, yeah, it's hard, uh, it's hard to remember those books I read in 1983, but, um, it was, yeah, it's interesting to see how it started. Um, and yeah, the, it's certainly interesting from a historical point of view, maybe especially for someone who knows DC better than I do. Um, and you know, it I... I was interested. I did, even though the the flowery language kind of got to me. It was interesting, you know, enjoyable to read these. Um, One thing I will extent. say is that if you actually want to get into DC continuity, this is actually where you probably best start. Oh, because this actually leads directly into Crisis, mm-hmm. and then from Crisis, everything resets basically. So, so yeah. So how how much changed with with Crisis in this book? Well, um, after Crisis, Donna Troy's origin gets changed again. Yeah, I did see that. I guess they they somehow break her connection with Wonder Woman. Where in no in... no 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 they make it no. more direct. It, oh, make so, it more direct. Okay. So in the old continuity, so when she got introduced, and what the original story that Marvel Wolfman wrote is that she is just some like orphan that Wonder Woman saves. She brings back the Themyscira. They hit her with a ray, and she becomes like Amazonian. Um, after the after the Crisis reboot, they changed her to be Wonder Woman's like clone sister, who's mm. just like she got like aged up younger than her. Okay, I remember there was like an issue that uh, Brian K. Vaughan wrote where like uh, Wonder Woman got like de-aged and she looked exactly like Donna Troy, and the whole that was the whole story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So yeah, that was the big thing that got changed. Uh, of course, um, Barry Allen died, and he became um, Bar- Barry Allen died, and then uh, um, Wally West, the Flash and the current um, Kid Flash, he becomes the main Flash of the main Flash line and leaves the Titans. Okay. Uh, of course, Robin is now Nightwing. Well, that that then, that happened a little bit before Crisis, though, right? Yeah. Ha- so yeah, this this is like the main entry line into DC continuity in my opinion this this series here because it leads you from the pre-crisis universe directly into the post-crisis universe and then follows through with through that okay because you don't because re- you don't really need to read like Justice League or I think the only other series you you might need to read would be Batman the Outsiders but that's about it oh. so no, did did crisis change nightwing uh not really. I think it just changed like a few of the years that it happened. Okay. I don't think it changed the Judas contract storyline. Well, I, I can't really remember. I, I don't mm-hmm. have a, that well of a memory of that late into the run. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, one other thing maybe we should mention is I guess um, ar- around 1984, DC had some kind of a thing where they were 
doing like a hardcover and softcover version do, of the comic. Do, do you want me to ex- do you want me to how explain that works because it becomes a bit confusing for the issue numbers for this series? Mm-hmm. Okay. So basically, they did like a hardcover softcover thing, and I, this is around when the direct market was popping up, mm-hmm. like right at that time. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to have something for the direct market, and then for the like the newsstands and the news agencies and whatever. So basically, they split the series into two. They had the so New Teen Titans became Tales of the Teen Titans, and then they did another series where it takes place like three months after the events of New Teen Titans, and they just re, they just called that New Teen Titans. Yeah, and then after like what after a certain a year or something, then the the Tales of the New Teen Titans became a reprint of the the quote unquote hardcover version, right? Yeah, it became a reprint of the like issues one onwards of the new new Teen Titans, Teen Titans Volume Two, mm-hmm. and then eventually that series, New Teen Titans Volume Two, that gets renamed to the New Titans. So, how long did that hardcover softcover situation last? I think it only lasted for like two years, from what I can gather. I wouldn't have guessed that it would have been such a popular idea among the readers. <laughs> nah, nah. Apparently it, like, split the reader base, and eventually, you know, they, they stopped doing it, and then it just became more, like, direct market stuff. Mm-hmm. And then and the series ran, New Titans ran to, like, 96, and then eventually they just renamed it Titans. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're barely even teens in, in this, <laughs> in the, at this time that we're reading. Yeah. Well, they keep they keep getting rebooted as teens. Don't don't worry about that. <laughs> right. Except, except in, for, in the animated cartoons, they get younger, right? Yeah. Except for Cyborg, he he's older now. Right. Well, isn't Cyborg in the Justice League now, or he has yeah. been? Um, basically, they rebooted his entire origin in New Fifty Two. He's not a um. So, the difference between old Cyborg and new Cyborg is that old Cyborg is kind of like the um the Bionic Man, you know, like. He got he got like injured and he had to be like rebuilt. Mm-hmm. And in the original series, it's by his father. In post New Fifty Two, he gets it's the same kind of origin where he walks in on his father doing like an experiment, but he gets sucked into like apocalypse, and then his body becomes infused with like apocalyptic technology, and he doesn't like fully understand it. Hmm. That's the main difference between the two. Okay. And he's not really written that interestingly, to be honest. <laughs> it, if it's if it's not Jeff Johns or Marv Wolfman writing him, he's just kind of there. Hmm. I see. Yeah. Well, that's you know a, a problem with with Marvel and DC, where it really depends on the writer if you're going to get a good version of a certain character or not. Yeah. In my opinion, um, like Raven is one other character that uh, she had an interesting. Um, DC Zoom book. Okay. Uh, no, it's not, not Zoom. DC Inc. You know that YA thing they have going? Okay. Yeah, the actual um, the author of that, she actually did her homework and she actually wrote Raven as a very specific empath that has, and she sort of, you know, she's, she, I think she's a good character for YA audiences because she's very, you know, emotional based. Very. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Although at the same time, in these issues, she doesn't really show emotion very well. Uh, I remember there's, there's a very funny um, line, and you know she, she's always like really brooding. I remember mm. there was like a issue of it was the crossover between New Teen Titans and Batman and the Outsiders. Are you familiar with the characters from that series? Not really. No, I actually well, met I, I met uh, Dan Mishkin. Uh, Last year, uh, I know the or not. It wasn't. Well, I meant Michigan, but no, the writer of of uh, uh, Batman the Outsiders was but Maya Mike Barr. Yeah, he hey, you, uh, also him. He gave a speech at the Batman conference last spring. Yeah, I, I remember hearing that. That was good. Yeah, yeah, but, it was um, in the podcast. Mm-hmm. This is this is famous panel where like Halo is like this character from um, Batman the Outsiders. She's like a comet. She was like literally a comet infused with like the body of like this blonde girl, and she. And she kind of has like the personality of like a uh, of like a young child. Like she's very childlike. Mm-hmm. And she, this is one panel where she's like, "Look, Raven, look at my wonderful room. Isn't it like lovely?" And then like Raven's like, "Yes, Halo, it's very lovely." And then there's like a four bubble that says, "She's so joyful. The emotions that were robbed of me." 
<laughs> mm. Yeah, it's it sounds yeah. Reven is really emo. She probably listens to the Smiths. <laughs> uh, I, I remember there was like a mini series that Marvel from wrote in the in the mid two thousands, and it like labeled itself as like the emo Raven or some shit. <laughs> there you see. What was funny is that she wasn't even supposed to be a part of this series. Apparently, well, they they talk about in in the series where she had appeared to the JLA one other time. What, did that happen in the JLA book? No, I don't think so. No, it, it was just something that happened. I guess, I guess it was just a story explanation as to why the JLA okay. can't solve the Trigon crisis. That's why, like, when she goes to jail, they're like, "Oh yeah, you showed up before." Okay. How was she? I hadn't heard this. That she wasn't originally supposed to be in this book. How... Oh, so when they were coming up with the original, like the new members, uh, Marv obviously had the idea for a Cyborg because he wanted a black character in a Titans book, which was denied to him previously. Mm. And Cy- and she wanted, and he wanted um, Starfire. Um, but they told him that they wanted like a magic character. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to, and he wanted to reuse the empath concept that he introduced in Werewolf by Night, I believe, mm. back at Marvel. So yeah, he came up with that character. So that's where Raven came from. I see. And she was added quite late, from what I understand, like really close to publication. Hmm. I see. Well, it's interesting then that she ends up being the force that brings the group together. Yeah. Which makes me makes me wonder how it was originally written. Yeah, how was he planning to get them get them together before she was created? Don't know. We'd have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, what did you think of like the, the the individual stories that were shown in the mini series? Hmm. They did one for Cyborg, Starfire, Beast Boy, and Raven. Right. Well, yeah, some some of what was covered in those, well, not so much for Changeling, but some, the others were I think so, somewhat, you know, already covered. I don't to me they felt a little too long to be or I felt like they were stretched a little in order to fit an issue where I didn't really feel like the stories needed to be as long as they were. Um I don't know. I I got a little annoyed with the uh, cyborg issue, partly because of the language issue I talked about, where suddenly he's talking like Shakespeare. Um, But also, you know, there's this other character who keeps getting him in trouble. Um, And... Oh, the, um, that, like, thug character? Yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I guess they... uh, That happens in real life, I guess, where certain bad friends will drag other people into into trouble but i don't know it i just found that that aspect kind of annoying it becomes like a terrorist <laughs> at the end of it doesn't it yeah well that yeah he kind of goes off the rails there he's not just the guy who who gets cyborg really? in trouble he's trying to frame him for for their Isn't there like terrorist a scene attack. Where they're like at the twin towers trying to do something uh i think it was the united nations oh united nations yeah twin towers Ooh. yeah that would have been uh <laughs> kind of shocking to read later, yeah. No, they were, they were attacking the United Nations or trying to. Mm. Yeah, those were okay, but I I didn't like them as much as regular Teen Titans issues. Yeah, I think they they wanted to do that just to expand on the characters that they created. Besides, again, I think with the Beast Boy one, they were just trying to explain what happened to him between. I think it was the Copperman Doom Patrol run up until now. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, he was not a new character, but they just needed to fill in the in-between time. And also, yeah. I guess, I can't remember, one of one of the prefaces to one of the books, either by Wolfman or by Len Wein, um, is talking about how uh, the book was starting to sell really well, and, and DC Editorial was like, well, what else? what else Teen Titans can we put out? Um, so they came up with that mini series. Yeah, that was actually like they actually did that alongside of it. That would have been murder on George Prez's arms. Right. Yeah. Who who was the artist on the mini series? It wasn't Perez, was it? I think it was Perez. Was it? 
Starfire one. Yeah, that was that was Perez. I can tell from a few of these panels. I do like the framing device of it though. You know how they have the um, you know how it's like they're like they're talking about it for like a campfire. Oh yeah, they're they're all on a camping trip, and and one by one, these guys are the characters are bringing up their backstories. Yeah, I'm looking at the cyborg credits. Yeah, Marv Wolfman and George Perez. Yeah. So you're you're saying they they didn't put two out two issues per month out at that point, or did they? Or, or they did, did they? I think. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if if the idea was to have more product out, it wouldn't make sense to stop the regular book, but. I mean, I don't, that, I don't know how fast they, how fast an artist Perez is, but <laughs> must well, have been pretty fast. I, well, I mean, at one point he was doing Wonder Woman and Teen Titans at the oh, same wow. time. Okay, I think I'm not sure. He he did drop off the Titans a few times, and it might have been because of that. But he did do them both at one point. I know hmm. there must be hell on his arm for the kind of work that he does. Yeah. Well, did I understand Perez is retired now? Yeah, Perez is um, retired now. I believe he's he said that he has he's had eyesight problems, so mm. he's also he's also not doing conventions anymore. He had like a last year was his last year for conventions. Mm-hmm. Oh, Wolfman still writes though. He um he uh he he even wrote a lot of the story for that MMO that DC made for for what like an MMO like a video game. Oh, okay. He does like he he believes that like if you're a writer you should you should like extend yourself to writing all these different things. He's written like novelizations. I know he did the novel for Crisis on Infinite Earths and he wrote it from the perspective of the Flash. Hmm. Okay. The which which Flash? Oh, Barry Allen. He and it's and it's interesting because Barry Allen in the Crisis series he's like in prison. He's like in prison by um what's his face the. Guy with the yellow mask. Fuck. Why am I forgetting his name? <laughs> He's imprisoned by him and the monitor, and it's, I, I gotta read it somewhere. That sounds interesting. I did meet uh, Marv Wolfman once. Um, where, where was that? Uh, at Emerald City Comic Con in 2011. Um, I was there for the podcast and and talked to a lot of different people at their tables, um, including Wolfman, who, as I recall, he he seemed a little stiff to talk to he didn't seem completely welcoming to me to talk to him for the podcast but he did he was on the podcast from what, I, from what i've ago, heard man. apparently he did from what i understand it like a while for a while he didn't like really understand podcasts or something hmm. i did hear him on one podcast though it was like it might have been the bat the bat force one i think he was on that one okay might have been something he had to be brung around to, so. Yeah, well, it was 2011, and podcasting was... It had been around a while, but still a lot of people weren't aware of it. You did it, like, pre-YouTube, so... <laughs> <laughs> right, well, yeah, our podcast started in 2005. I mean, I remember... Do you know how old I was in 2005? <laughs> you were born. <laughs> yeah, I was born, but... I wasn't even 10, so... Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the New Teen Titans is published by DC Comics. Let us know what you think. Email us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com. Tweet us at Decon Comics. Like our Facebook page or join our active Facebook group. We also invite you to join us on Patreon. Our tiers start at just $2 a month. Pledge at least $4 a month to get our Patreon-only series Spider-Man 1963 and Tim Catches Up with the MCU, where this coming Saturday we'll release our review of Avengers Infinity War. Go to patreon.com slash deconcomics to join the fun. Can you think of one person you know who would enjoy what we're doing on Deconstructing Comics and Critiquing Comics? Send that person a text message right now and let them know about our show. Thanks. You can also help us get noticed by reviewing us on Apple or any other podcast source. 
Do your shopping at deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon so that we get a percentage of the sale. And share our episodes on your social media. We appreciate your support in bringing Deconstructing Comics, Critiquing Comics, and To the Bat Poles to a larger audience. Our theme is from bensound.com. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and Mulele and I will critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. Next week on Deconstructing Comics, we remember Tom Spurgeon, the extraordinary comics journalist and advocate who we lost much too soon this past November. I'll be joined by Kumar, Caitlin McGurk at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum, Tom's childhood friend and comic strip collaborator Dan Wright, and Gil Roth of the Virtual Memories Show podcast to memorialize this unforgettable figure in comics history. Tom Spurgeon Tribute Show here next week. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. Thank you.